Our adventure starts with the incredible intervertebral joints. Intervertebral joints, also known as intervertebral articulations, are essential connections between adjacent vertebral bodies and the vertebral column, playing a vital role in providing flexibility, shock absorption, and support to the spine. These joints consist of two main components, intervertebral discs and facet joints. Let me tell you about these two components in detail. Intervertebral discs. Intervertebral discs are fibrocartilaginous cushions situated between the vertebral bodies. These discs allow various movements of the spine, including bending, twisting, and extension. It is composed of a tough outer layer called the annulus fibrosus and a gel-like inner core known as the nucleus pulposus. They serve as shock absorbers, distributing weight and loads encountered during everyday activities, thus preventing excessive stress on individual vertebrae. The intervertebral discs play a crucial role in upholding the alignment of the vertebral column, providing essential support for its stability and overall structure. Additionally, they serve as protective barriers, preventing the erosion of the vertebral body surfaces. The main joints connecting the vertebral bodies from C2 to S1 are known as intervertebral discs, Working hand-in-hand hand with the intervertebral discs are the trusty vertebral end plates, which are sheets of hyaline cartilage. Together, they form a strong bond that links adjacent vertebral bodies and maintains the spine stability. But here's the real kicker, these intervertebral discs are no slouches. They are specially designed to bear weight and provide the strength needed for everyday activities. And if you look at a model of the spine, you will notice that, as we move down the spine, they even get thicker, gearing up to handle even more. These superhero-like structures are classified as secondary cartilaginous joints, also known as symphyses. They may involve either hyaline or fibrocartilage. These joints are slightly mobile, called amphiarthroses. At a symphysis, the opposed bony surfaces are coated with hyaline cartilage and united by fibrocartilage, usually in the form of a disc. The bones are further united by ligamentous bands. Other examples of secondary cartilaginous joints are pubic symphysis or also called symphysis pubis and the articulation between manubrium and body of sternum. So, there you have it, the incredible intervertebral discs, the true superheroes of your spine, working tirelessly to keep your vertebral column strong, stable, and ready to tackle whatever life throws at you. In addition to the intervertebral discs, the cervical vertebrae C3 to C7 have these neat little synovial joints called uncovertebral joints, also called joints of Lushka. These joints form between the uncinate processes, which are crests on the upper side regions of the vertebral bodies, and the lower side surfaces of the vertebral bodies just above them. Excitingly, these joints play a vital role in controlling movements of the cervical spine and contribute to neck stabilization. Unfortunately, the uncovertebral joints are prone to arthritic changes, leading to the formation of bone spurs. These pesky spurs can cause neck pain, making life a little less enjoyable for some individuals. Now let me tell you about the facet joints also known as facet joints or the zigapophyseal joints. Facet joints are synovial joints located on the posterior aspect of the vertebral column. 
Each vertebra has two facet joints, one on each side, connecting it to the adjacent vertebrae above and below. Formed between the superior and inferior articular processes of adjacent vertebrae, they are the driving force behind the spine's flexibility. It is a synovial joint and has a joint cavity surrounded by joint capsule. Want to bend, extend, or do some groovy lateral bending? Thank the facet joints for that smooth groove. They're always up for some fun rotation, too, though not as much as the party they throw in the lumbar region. These joints are instrumental in guiding and limiting the movements of the spine, acting as stabilizers to prevent excessive motion that may lead to injury. The zigapophyseal joints are responsible for facilitating gliding movements in the vertebral column. However, the type of movements allowed by these joints varies depending on the specific region of the spine and the shape and orientation of the articular surfaces. In the cervical region, the facet joints slope in an inferior direction, extending from anterior to posterior. Due to this particular configuration, a wide range of movements are made feasible. These include rotation, lateral flexion, extension, and flexion. Moving to the thoracic region, the facet joints are oriented vertically, which limits the extent of flexion and extension but promotes rotational movements. This design is essential for the stability of the thoracic spine, which primarily needs to accommodate rotational actions, as it articulated with thorax. In the lumbar region, the facet joints are positioned in the sagittal plane, with adjacent processes interlocked. This interlocking arrangement restricts flexion, extension, and lateral flexion to some extent. However, there is still some degree of movement possible in these directions to ensure flexibility and functional versatility in the lower back. So, depending on the region of the vertebral column and the specific arrangement of the facet joints, the spine can perform a remarkable array of movements, contributing to our overall mobility and agility. At each level, Two facet joints in the intervertebral disc form something known as the spinal motion segment, or the three-joint complex. The joints in the disc work together as the motion segment to provide stability to the spine and prevent movements that could potentially damage the spinal cord. Intervertebral joints can further be classified as joints of the vertebral bodies and joints of the vertebral arches. They become integral to the overall structure and function of the vertebral column. As mentioned before, these joints are responsible for enabling a broad range of motion while providing vital support and shock absorption. However, the integrity of these joints can be compromised in conditions such as disc bulge or disc generation that can be caused due to excessive loading and age-related changes respectively. The intervertebral joints are supported by major ligaments of the spine. These ligaments include Let me tell you about the anterior longitudinal ligament first. The vertebral bodies and intervertebral discs front and lateral surfaces are protected and linked by a robust, wide fibrous band known as the anterior longitudinal ligament. 
This ligament originates from the front of the occipital bone, near the foramen magnum, and also attaches to the anterior tubercle of the atlas, C1 vertebra. From there, it extends downwards to the anterior surface of the upper sacrum. It plays a crucial role as the sole ligament that restricts excessive backward bending or hyperextension of the spine. Next is a ligament known as the posterior longitudinal ligament. The posterior longitudinal ligament is situated along the back surfaces of the vertebral bodies within the vertebral canal. It attaches to the vertebral bodies and primarily to the intervertebral discs, spanning from the body of C2 to the sacrum. From its upper attachment, the ligament continues into the intracranial part of the base of the skull, forming the tectorial membrane. In comparison to the anterior longitudinal ligament, this ligament is narrower and relatively less robust. Its main functions are to resist excessive forward bending or hyperflexion of the vertebral column and prevent the posterior herniation of an intervertebral disc's nucleus pulposus. These two ligaments support the joints between the vertebral bodies, meaning they support the intervertebral disc joints. Now let's look at some of the other ligaments of the intervertebral joints. Ligamenta flava. The ligamenta flava, which is more commonly referred to as ligamentum flavum, singular, or broad, thin ligaments that connect the laminae of adjacent vertebral arches on both sides. These ligaments consist mainly of yellow elastic tissue and are located on the posterior surface of the vertebral canal. Each ligament runs almost vertically, connecting the front surface of the lamina above to the back surface of the lamina below. As they approach the midline, the ligaments on opposite sides tend to converge and blend together. The primary functions of the ligamenta flava are twofold. Firstly, they resist the separation of the laminae during flexion, helping to maintain stability in the spine. Secondly, they assist in extending the vertebral column back to its upright anatomical position. This elastic nature of the ligamenta flava enables them to play a crucial role in supporting the spine during various movements and maintaining proper posture. Let's look at the ligament known as the interspinous ligaments. The interspinous ligaments are responsible for connecting the spinous processes of adjacent vertebrae. These ligaments are thin and extend from the base to the apex of each spinous process. They blend with the ligamenta flava on the front side, ventrally, and the supraspinous ligament on the back side, dorsally. Together, these ligaments provide support and stability to the vertebral column, contributing to its overall structure and function during various movements and activities. Now let's look at the supraspinous ligament. The supraspinous ligament is a cord-like band that extends along and connects the tips of the spinous processes. This ligament extends from the seventh cervical vertebra, C7, to the sacrum. It maintains continuity with the nuchal ligament in the cervical region. It is closely related to the interspinous ligaments as you can see here. The primary functions of the supraspinous ligament are to prevent excessive separation of the spinous processes during flexion and to resist hyperflexion of the spine. Then we have the intertransverse ligaments. The intertransverse ligaments are flat bands of connective tissue that serve to connect the transverse processes of neighboring vertebrae. 
They run from the upper border of one vertebra's transverse process to the lower border of the transverse process of the vertebra above it. These ligaments are unique in that they lack distinct medial and lateral borders and are often intertwined with adjacent muscles in the spine. The primary role of the intertransverse ligaments is to restrict excessive lateral flexion of the vertebral column. By providing stability and limiting side-to-side -side bending, they help maintain the structural integrity of the spine during various movements and activities. While not as well-defined as some other ligaments, their contribution to the overall support and function of the vertebral column should not be overlooked. The last ligament that we will discuss is the nuchal ligament also known as ligamentum nuchi. The nuchal ligament is a robust, triangular, and fibroelastic band located at the back of the neck. It stretches from the base of the skull, specifically the external occipital protuberance, to the spinous process of 7th cervical vertebra, C7, in the midline. The apex of the triangular nuchal ligament connects to the tip of the spinous process of C7, where it merges with the supraspinous ligament below. The primary function of the nuchal ligament is to provide support to the head. It resists excessive flexion of the neck and helps to restore the head to its anatomical position after movements. Furthermore, this ligament serves as a surface for the attachment of muscles in the posterior neck and shoulder region, adding to its importance in facilitating various movements and maintaining the stability of the upper body. That is all about the intervertebral joints. We will now discuss the craniovertebral joints next. Welcome to Skydia.com, your one-stop destination for medical online learning. Dive into our extensive catalog of in-depth animated videos, meticulously tailored for students, residents, and even practicing healthcare professionals. With over 40 medical courses available, covering topics from the fundamental anatomy to the complex endocrinology and everything in between. Explore various teaching styles. Engage with our immersive videos, purposefully designed to make learning not only incredibly enjoyable, but exceptionally effective. To get started on your path to excellence, take advantage of our exclusive free trial and gain immediate access to a wealth of educational resources. Skydia.com, your journey to exceptional medical education begins here.